Greetings podcast listeners, after a two month break, welcome back to a new episode of History from One Student to Another. In this episode, we'll be looking at the question, what was the British public's attitude towards war? There are a few key angles we can use to look at this question. The peace ballot and attitudes towards the League of Nations, the Spanish Civil War, attitudes towards rearmament policies, and public opinion on appeasement and the League of Nations. Firstly, let's look at the peace ballot, an unofficial ballot run by the National Declaration Committee of the League of Nations Union that saw 38% of the adult population vote overwhelmingly in support of the League of Nations. The ballot was sparked by failures at the World Disarmament Conference and the continued undermining of the League's influence and credibility. With Britain seemingly lacking support of the League, the British public were keen to express their support for the League amidst fears that the national government could withdraw its official policy of support for the League of Nations. The peace ballot, which was largely supported by the British media, save for the Daily Express, which was owned by peace ballot opposer Lord Beaverbrook, aimed to prove that the British public wholeheartedly supported the League of Nations being at the centre of British foreign policy. After the results of the ballot were released, it was seen as a huge success. After 500,000 supporters volunteered and took on the task of interviewing the people from late 1934, the poll was completed and the results announced on June 27, 1935. The results from the English, Welsh and Scottish, and across all social classes, overwhelmingly supported the League of Nations and controls on armaments. 97% of ballot respondents stated that Britain should remain a member of the League, 92% said they were in favour of an international agreement on the reduction of arms, 82.5% were in favour of the abolition of national military and naval aircraft, and 90% supported the prohibition of war profits. Lord Cecil of Chelwood, the President of the League of Nations Union, said that the results of the ballot indicated that the British public supported the idea of collective security and a collective response in the event of a threat to life and the stability of Europe. When asked if nations should unite against a country that insisted on attacking another by use of economic and non-military measures, 86.8% of respondents answered yes. Then, when asked if this extended to military measures, if necessary, 58.7%, a reduced majority answered yes. British historian A.J.P. Taylor argued for the importance of this peace ballot, which had become a ringing endorsement of collective security. He argues that the question on military collective security was the most important question, as the goal of international disarmament was already unachievable in the current climate where Adolf Hitler appeared incredibly hostile as he was rearming Germany. The Conservative government appeared to pay attention to the results of the ballot, taking the League into greater account in its foreign policies. In mid-July 1936, Spain descended into civil war as the Socialists and Republicans, who had won control of the government in 1931, tried to abolish the monarchy. The Spanish Civil War broke out on the 17th of July 1936 as the Socialists and Republicans, who had won control of the government, tried to abolish the monarchy, angering the Nationalists. The Republicans were loyal to the politically left-leaning Popular Front government, which came to power by winning the general elections on the 16th of February 1936. They deposed King Alfonso XIII, abolishing the Spanish monarchy and sparking the Spanish Civil War. After the Republicans were defeated on the 1st of April 1939, the Popular Front was dissolved. Meanwhile, the Nationalists were a military group, consisting of mainly conservatives, monarchists and fascists, who instigated a coup and seized control of loyal territory in July 1936. The Nationalists were led by military generals, with General Francisco Franco serving as the main leader. In September 1936, the Republican government appealed to the League for assistance against the Nationalists. However, members of the League were unwilling to intervene, as they perceived the civil war as being part of Spanish internal affairs. Therefore, they set up the Non-Intervention Committee with the aim of preventing foreign involvement in the Spanish Civil War. It consisted of representatives for 27 countries, including Germany and Italy. In September 1936, a non-intervention agreement was drawn up in London and signed by 27 countries, including Germany, Britain, France, the Soviet Union and Italy. Hitler continued to give aid, but attempted to disguise this by sending the men, planes, tanks and munitions via Portugal. He sent a squadron from the German Air Force, called Wolfwaffe, to Spain, where they practiced a new tactic of dive-bombing towns instead of military targets, bringing fear and terror onto the population. 
Hitler believed that if he was able to form a Spanish-Italian-German alliance, he would be able to weaken France by surrounding it, and wished to use the Spanish Civil War to build stronger ties. However, Franco and Hitler disliked each other, and Franco demanded that Spain be rewarded with overseas territories if they assisted Germany in the war. Despite Spain not becoming a German ally, involvement in the Spanish Civil War was beneficial for Hitler, who was able to strengthen his relationship with Mussolini and bring valuable experience to the German Air Force, which would help them in their mission of conquering Europe in the Second World War. Although the League clearly had support in the 1920s and 30s, it's not around today as it was a failure. Let's look at some of the reasons for the League's failure. One of the reasons was due to weak powers. The League's weakness was that it did not have its own army. Hence, when countries were unwilling to send their armies abroad to fight, the League was unable to enforce its decisions and appeared useless and weak. Another reason was because not all countries were members. The world's leading economic power, the USA, had become isolationist following the First World War and hadn't joined the League because the Republican US Congress had refused to join the League of Nations as they were against the treaty and the League of Nations. As non-members could continue trading despite sanctions or bans, the League's economic sanctions proved to be wholly ineffective. Thirdly, slow decision-making was another factor that devalued the League. For example, it took a whole year for the report on the Manchurian crisis to be written, and while the League of Nations discussed the Abyssinian crisis over a period of 10 months, Mussolini planned and executed a full-scale invasion of Abyssinia. Fourthly, external factors led to policies of the League being disregarded. For example, the Great Depression meant that countries were unwilling to impose economic sanctions, fearing that it would damage their economies. Moreover, when big bullies or powerful members like Japan, Italy and Germany became more aggressive in the 1930s as they began rearming and invading weaker countries, members of the League either ignored their violations or failed to act collectively. Fifth, the factor of the Treaty of Versailles also weakened the League. This is because many countries now believe the Treaty of Versailles was unfair. Hence, they were lenient with Germany and its requirements under the Treaty of Versailles. For example, Britain allowed the German Navy to expand under the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, and also with France carried out the policy of appeasement. Finally, members often acted in their own interests. For example, Britain did not close the Suez Canal to Italy during the Abyssinian Crisis as they feared an attack on their navy and retaliation in the form of an attack on their empire. So, in summary, the British attitude towards war was to do whatever was possible to avoid another war, the one as devastating as the First World War, which was known as the Great War and the War to End All Wars. But we know that the War to End All Wars never came about because, to this day, many, many wars still take place across the globe. Thank you for listening to this episode of History from One Student to Another. This is the last episode in my series on Britain from 1919 to 1939. I hope you have enjoyed this series and that it has been beneficial to you. I hope that it has included everything that you would need. This is the first series that I have completely studied on my own, so I hope that it has been up to the standard of the previous series. Please use the links in the description of this episode to provide me with feedback, and if you can, donate to me and support the podcast. There are also links to my social media and other methods of contacting me. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.